So we are going to talk about rebuilding the broken. And I know it will not come as a shock to anyone for me to state that we live in a broken world. That's pretty much stating the obvious, isn't it? We are well aware of brokenness all around us, brokenness in our own lives even. We're aware of brokenness in the government. Maybe we're more aware of that in recent weeks than we have been. We're aware of broken relationships, probably in all of our families. We know about some relationships that are broken. We know that we live in a broken environment. The environmentalists tell us that all the time, global warming. And so we know that there's some brokenness in our environment. We know about broken promises. No doubt we've had promises made to us that have been broken and possibly we've made promises to others that we have broken. So we understand about broken promises. This bizarre year of 2020, and I for one am very thankful that it is nearing an end. I don't want to presume to say 2021 will be better, but I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that it will be. But this bizarre year of 2020 has brought a tremendous amount of brokenness to so many people, hasn't it? I think about those whose health has been broken by this coronavirus. And there are those that we know whose health has been broken by it. Even more difficult is those whose happiness has been broken for those who have literally lost loved ones. Thousands of loved ones have been lost through this, and so families have been broken because of that. And we think about as the church, how our fellowship and our community has experienced a degree of brokenness. There aren't as many of us sitting in this room as we've been accustomed to in the past. And so we are not as connected as we like to be, as we have been in the past. So we understand about brokenness in the body of Christ as well. Now, simply giving you this catalog list of brokenness doesn't really do a lot of good. It's kind of pointless to just talk about the brokenness around us, and it doesn't solve anything to just list all of those kinds of things. The key is, and this is the hopeful, optimistic part, the key is to rebuild from brokenness. I think about broken communities devastated by things like hurricanes and wildfires and tornadoes. And I guess this has been a record year for hurricanes, so there's been more brokenness this year because of things like that. But communities that are broken by those natural disasters, I'm, I'm always inspired when I hear things like people saying, we are going to rebuild, and we're going to rebuild better and stronger than we were before. I like that kind of optimism, and that's the kind of optimism that we as the people of God need to have because we really are in the rebuilding and restoration business as God's people. So having said those things, that's why I believe a study of Nehemiah is so important for us to begin today. I literally believe that this is the right focus for the right time. And in a few moments, we're going to find out how literally this is the right time to be studying the book of Nehemiah. I know that we will, as I have been recently, inspired by the writings of this humble man of God. And I get that sense as I read Nehemiah that he was indeed a humble, dedicated man of God. In fact, if you've not spent some time looking at Nehemiah, I encourage you to be reading through it to become more familiar with it for what we're going to be studying in upcoming weeks. But the book of Nehemiah sounds about as much like a, one man's personal journal as it is an inspired historic account of things that went on at that time through him largely. Because you'll read these personal things that he said in the book, such as when he said, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. When he said things like, I also applied myself to the work on the wall. And when he said things like, remember me, O God, for good. So throughout the 13 chapters of Nehemiah, we are going to be inspired by a man of prayer 
who trusted God to do that which could not be done in any other way. And as a result, Nehemiah sets forth for us a tremendous, great example of how humility and prayer and hard work and dedication bring about restoration amidst brokenness. So that's the main thing that I hope we really sense and pick up on in the next few weeks as we study through the book of Nehemiah. Let's pause for a few moments to talk about Nehemiah the man. We won't find this information in chapter two, but we will, or in chapter one, but we will over in chapter two, that we are told about Nehemiah that he was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. So that frames him and it frames the time frame as well. King Artaxerxes, we can learn, was a ruler of the Persian Empire from 464 to 423 BC. Or in other words, long before we ever lived, right? None of us had the opportunity to remember him as a ruler. So the thing that really stands out is Nehemiah is identified as a cupbearer to this very important ruler, in fact, the most powerful man in the world of the day. He was a cupbearer to that king. And so how it is that a Jewish man was able to be in such an important position is something we're not told, but we just marvel at who Nehemiah was because it speaks volumes about him as an individual. He had to be a man of impeccable character because the most powerful man in the world would have, would have not settled for anything less than that. And so Nehemiah had to be an outstanding individual. I would put him on par with men like Daniel and Joseph in particular. So we have a tremendous amount of respect for Nehemiah as a man of character. As we said, he was a cupbearer, and we might want to ask the question, well, what exactly does a cupbearer do? Well, it's kind of a risky vocation, a risky job, because at every single meal that was brought to the king, the cupbearer would test the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So I guess the way that it went was the food and the drink are brought in and a little wine is poured into the cupbearer's cup and he swigs it down and I guess you probably wait for a few moments. If he doesn't keel over dead, then probably the king figures it's safe enough to drink wine that's been brought in. So it is a job not without a great deal of risk. Literally, a cupbearer puts his life on the line at every single meal. But a cupbearer was a man who was very, very close to the king. And so to be close to the king in, in a public setting as he was, we had presumed for one thing that he had to be a handsome, good looking man. So no doubt he was. He had to be cultured. He had to understand the ways of the Persians. He had to be knowledgeable in the court procedures. So he had to be well versed and taught in those things. He had to be able to converse with the king. I mean, he's right there beside the king. And no doubt from time to time, the king would ask questions and seek his advice. And so he had to have a measure of wisdom to advise the king. So you get the idea to be a cupbearer was a huge privilege, but also a huge responsibility. So that kind of frames the situation about Nehemiah the man and his situation and leads us into the first three verses that I want you to follow along with me in. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 as we begin to make our way into this study. We're told that the words, these are the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, he says, while I was in Susa, the capital, get the idea, it's like a personal journal, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity, and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Those three verses, we get some very important 
who, what, when, and where information. The who is pretty obvious. It's about Nehemiah. The when is very interesting. I told you this was the right study at the right time. The month of Chislev is mentioned there. We don't have that on our 12-month calendar. But we understand that that particular month would have been mid-November to mid-December. So I thought, well, that's kind of appropriate that we would start this study on November the 15th, exactly mid-November. So that's the setting of the book of Nehemiah, mid-November to mid-December. We are told not only that concerning the month, but we're told it was the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. We can very quickly calculate that and figure that out to be the year 444 BC. So that's exactly when it happened, mid-November to mid-December of the year 444 BC. The where is mentioned, namely Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire and also the palace of the king, probably the winter palace of the king. The what is what we're going to really zero in on because the what is a report that is destined to change everything, especially for Nehemiah. Because we look in those verses and we find that Nehemiah asks a question. He asks a question of, of some people who've just come back from Jerusalem, and he gets a report about Jerusalem and his fellow Jews. Now, to give a little bit more background, this is all after the Babylonian captivity. After King Nebuchadnezzar, years before, had come in and destroyed the city and taken captives and dispersed the Jews. This is several years after that. And so that situation is going on. And so Nehemiah is asking a question of those who've just come back from Jerusalem. And the report that he gets is very, very disturbing. He says the people there are in serious trouble. The walls have been broken down. The gates have been, been burned. And so here they are helpless living in this destroyed city. And so the news is very, very distressing to Nehemiah. And I want you to notice, and this says, speaks volumes about him. Look in verse 4 at how he responds to the news. He said, when I heard these words, notice this, I sat down and I wept. He says, and I mourned for days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We'll get into that a little bit more, but the response of Nehemiah that tells us a great deal about his character, about who he is. You know how we've heard the phrase, this changes everything? There are those kind of moments in life. We've probably had a, a few of those. This changes everything. Suddenly life goes in a whole another direction. There are those moments when you get some news when you get some information that just drastically changes everything, life suddenly goes maybe like 180 degrees in another direction. Many of us will recall, as we saw the news footage of President George Bush sitting in a Florida school classroom on the morning of September the 11th, 2001. Remember his press secretary coming up to him, whispering something in his ear. And he sat there basically motionless for a few moments before there was any kind of a reaction. But obviously, he heard something that changed everything. He got some life-changing news that day. And we know that the news that he got in that moment changed the entire direction of his presidency. This changes everything. On a more personal note, I was thinking about a story concerning Isaac. You've heard it shared before. I think it is so appropriate concerning his grandfather, where he was just getting in the car to go off to a military recruiter's office, and he got a phone call that changed everything, that changed the direction of his life. Instead of military service, he went the direction of pastoral ministry. This changed everything, and the news that Nehemiah got that mid-November to mid-December of 444 B.C. was destined to change his life forever from that point forward. This changes everything. It's been said that that which makes people laugh or cry is an indication of their character. 
What is it that makes you laugh? What is it that brings you to tears? That says a lot about who and what you are. Verse 4 is so very telling about Nehemiah's character. We can almost picture him responding to the news that he received, deeply mourning and praying and fasting. This is something that touched him deeply to the core of his character and revealed to us that he was a man of deep passion and a deep compassion for the things of God and the people of God. What makes that so striking is again to go back to the job that Nehemiah had. Nehemiah had the best job in the whole empire of the day. He had the ideal job and the ideal position. No doubt he was very well cared for. As a cupbearer to the king, he lived in the palace. That's like having a room in the White House today. It doesn't get any better than that. So he had, a, he had that good position where he was well cared for. He had comfy quarters to live in. I would imagine he had the best of food because after all, he sampled the food and the drink that went to the king. So no doubt he had a portion of that as well. So he was fed and dined pretty well. He had the ear of the most powerful man in the world of the day. Again, you can't ask for a better position than what he had. Who could have wanted for more? But the thing that stands out to me here is that privilege and prestige which he had had not hardened his heart. How easy would it have been for Nehemiah to say, oh, that's their problem. I'm here, I've got responsibility, I need to focus on my job, and it's tough about the Jews in Jerusalem, but hey, what can I do about it? And he could have rationalized and gone about his own business. But indeed, he had not been hardened in his heart concerning the things of the Lord. He had an extreme soft spot in his heart for the things to do with the Lord God. So everything began to change for Nehemiah because he asked a question. That's the hinge where everything turns was he dared to ask a question. And you know, I guess the takeaway from that is we ought never to ask a question that we don't want an answer to, all right? If you're going to ask the question, you better be prepared for the answer. I think about in our conversations how easily we say things like, hi, how are you? Now let's get real about it. Do you really want to know when you go up to somebody and say, hi, how are you? Not to say that we're not concerned about others, but typically when we say, hi, how are you? We don't really expect an answer. and We usually don't give a detailed answer. We usually give a, oh, I'm pretty good, doing well. I'm, you know, things are fine. I remember one time years ago, and I've changed how I use that question. I don't use it nearly as much, but I remember asking an elderly man, hi, how are you? And he decided he would tell me. And I got a whole lot of detail. I got the latest rundown of his last medical appointment. And he had a lot of health issues. <laughs> I liked never got away. Hi, how are you? I didn't really, I, I was concerned about the man, but I was not prepared, kind of just in passing, to get all that information. I'd have gladly sat down at another time, I suppose, but I learned quickly. In asking that question, I should be careful about it because I actually could get a full answer. So typically I've decided to go with, hi, good to see you. I think that works a lot better. There are occasions where I want to say, hey, how are things going, when it's obvious there's a challenge that we need to talk about, but Nehemiah sincerely wanted to know when he asked that question. And again, what he heard was life changing. Because again, he had a heart of compassion, in this case, for the city of God and the things of God. So, I want us to join ourselves into the story of Nehemiah, and if we are going to journey with him in the next few weeks, I think that we need to begin with this most basic thing. And that is that we need to develop the same compassion that Nehemiah had. That's got to be the starting point for us. We want to have, we need to have the same kind of compassion that Nehemiah had. So I'd like us to ask ourselves the searching question, how deeply does the brokenness of the things of the Lord burden me? Let's begin there. Do I feel as Nehemiah felt? that the brokenness of the things of the Lord really, really burdened me. 
And that is a question that has invoked some soul searching on my part, and it will continue to do so as I study Nehemiah, and I pray that it does for you as well. So it begins in a sense with our own brokenness over the brokenness of the things of the Lord. I am reminded how Jesus mapped out the pathway to the things of the kingdom of God in the Beatitudes. When he stated in the first two, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, and blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, Matthew 5, 3 and 4. So when we are sensitive to our own brokenness, first of all, then we become more sensitive to the brokenness around us, the brokenness of the things of the Lord. We then are moving in the right direction. So if Nehemiah would inspire us, he would inspire us this morning to look at our brokenness and look at the brokenness around us. Again, it is immediately apparent that Nehemiah was a man who cared deeply about the right things. I'm sure he was conscientious with his job, but that job, as important and prestigious as it was, was not the most important thing for him. The thing that mattered, again, was the things concerning the Lord. He was concerned about his spiritual heritage. He cared deeply about the current needs of the people of God and the things of God. He cared about the future of the things of the Lord. He cared about God's glory and God's reputation when he was concerned about Jerusalem. I'm reminded in the Psalms, Psalm 50, verse 2, for example, where it says, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown. Zion, Jerusalem, the city of God, the perfection of beauty, the psalmist described it, God is shining out of that. Psalm 48, verse 2 says, Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, Mount Zion, the city of God in the far north, the city of the great king. So the psalmist could go on about how God's glory was displayed in Jerusalem, the city of God. So you get the idea of why Nehemiah was so broken about the brokenness of the city of God. Because that city where the glory of God would shine, the, the city of perfection that reflected literally on God, that city was in ruins... And thus it was a disgrace to the name and the reputation of God. And I think that's a large part of why Nehemiah was so broken hearted about it all. So God's reputation was at stake because of the current state of affairs. Jerusalem is called the city of God. But it also is a phrase with several meanings. It is the city that existed then. It is the city that exists in modern day Israel. It is also the new Jerusalem that is to come. But there's another meaning that has a great deal of meaning for us. Revelation 21, verses 9 to 11. The great vision that John the Apostle had. And one of the angels, it says, One of the seven angels came and spoke to me, spoke to John, and said, Come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And it says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. So the city of God is physical Jerusalem that existed, that was in ruins in Nehemiah's day. The city that exists in Israel today. The, the city of God is the new Jerusalem. We believe it to be a literal city, but we're also told there's another meaning to it. It is a figurative city. It is the bride, the wife of the lamb. It is the church. It is us. That's where I think things get intensely personal for us. When the city of God, the body of Christ, the church is broken, we should be broken hearted about it ourselves, shouldn't we? Amen. The brokenness within the body of Christ ought to burden us greatly as the broken Jerusalem burdened Nehemiah in his day. So the brokenness in our personal lives as members of the body of Christ, the brokenness in the collective body of Christ, the brokenness around us, it all begins 
with grief and with sorrow over that which is broken concerning the city of God, the things of God. So I wonder, to make it personal for us, if we heard a report as Nehemiah heard that day, what kinds of things would we likely hear about the state of the city of God? To speculate a little bit, I think that we might hear about how the people of God are hurting because freely gathering is hindered because of this pandemic environment. We are hurting for those reasons. It is not as it has been and we would like it to be. We would hear a report about some discouragement and depression concerning the current situation. I don't know if you've heard the statistics, but depression is skyrocketing amongst people across the, the land and around the world because of this current situation. We might hear a report to the effect that the body of Christ, the city of God, is not impacting its culture as much as would be good, as perhaps as much as God and Christ would desire. That not nearly enough people are being reached and converted with the gospel message. And we might hear reports such as we literally heard a little bit ago about persecuted Christians and what they're going through. Those are all things that we would hear if a report came to us about things within the city of God, in this case, the body of Christ. And so how do we react to the news that we hear? I think there's an important key found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow is in focus in this verse. And I think this is a very important verse. We could take a moment to turn there or check it out later. But 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this. For godly sorrow or godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief or worldly sorrow produces death. So... There's two kinds of sorrow, two kinds of grief. There is a worldly sorrow and there is a godly sorrow. Very important to see the difference between the two. Uh, worldly sorrow, worldly grief, it says here, cripples us. It leads to hopeless, helpless regret. It, it produces death. It does nothing but wound us. And it paralyzes us emotionally and does nothing good whatsoever. We just carry around that grief within and we feel bad about ourselves. But that's as far as it goes. Godly grief. And I believe that Nehemiah had godly grief. Notice in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, what godly grief does. For one thing, it leads to repentance. Repentance being a change of heart and a change of mind. It doesn't cause us to just wallow in pity and self-pity. But it says, I need to go a new direction. Godly sorrow moves us in another direction. It produces repentance and it leads to productive action. That's again exactly what happened with Nehemiah. He had godly sorrow over the news he received. He was broken hearted over the brokenness of the city of God. But we find out that it moved him. First of all, it moved him to prayer. And we're going to look next week at that prayer that he prayed, but it moved him to prayer and fasting. It broke his heart, but eventually it moved him into something very productive in terms of what it was that he was going to do. So I think that Nehemiah's example, again, speaks volumes to us. Speaks volumes to us about being deeply burdened by the state of the city of God, by the brokenness of the people of God and the things of God. And I think that we are not really ready to address and to respond to the problem of brokenness until we clearly see the problem and are broken in our own spirit in response. So we need to identify with Nehemiah again here at the beginning. And so Nehemiah's example, as we looked at, challenges us to assess the situation. And I pray that as we go forward from today throughout this next week and the days ahead, that we might take a look at the brokenness that is around us. God, make me sensitive to the brokenness that is around me, that is around us. And to get very specific about that, God, reveal the details of the brokenness around us. And that's kind of risky to do so, but I think it's a good thing to do. And then does that brokenness truly trouble me? Am I indifferent to the brokenness? Or is it moving me deeply in my heart? Is it moving me enough to fervent prayer in preparation for what God would do? This is where we need to begin.
as we journey along with Nehemiah. And so I would state that the journey of rebuilding amidst brokenness begins with our own brokenness about those things. Let's pray.